tiny, tiny castle Bet all your tiny, tiny dreams Bet all your tiny, tiny businesses Bet on, bet on, bet on, bet on you Bet on, bet on, bet on, bet on you Why you bet on strangers, strangers pass on through You should bet on neighbors, cause neighbors bet on you Your tiny, tiny barber shop Bet on you Tiny, tiny beauty shop. Bet on you. Oh, your tiny, tiny auto shop. Bet on you. Yeah, Greetings, everyone. Today's episode of I Like My Tea Sweet is one for the history books. Today we have Baron Snipe and Pamela Gibbs here to talk about what's going on in today's world and what happened in their generation with all the police brutality, racism, and everything else we can think of right now. Okay, well, happy to be here. I am, too. And the first thing I would like to do is check in with you all and to see how you guys are doing right now and how you feel with everything going on. Um, for me, um, I've been uh, writing an article for the newsletter about my feelings of what's been going on, and part of it is feeling anger, but also trying to find a way through, Uh, because this has been going on for generations and generations, and at this point, uh, I think we're at a point where we need to find a solution, to, to find a way through. Because as I see now, uh, we just can't go on doing this uh, year after year. It it has to change. I think the anger is at a level now that we have to find a way uh, we will destroy ourselves as a country. And that would be good. And um, uh, Aisha and Rain, I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, and really that's, that's uh, the major thing in my life right now to try to continue to do well. Um, I'm one of those folks at that age and with those underlying conditions that um, make me really have to pay attention to what's happening with the COVID-19 uh, and the coronavirus. So um, <clears throat> working hard really to protect myself and to try to be safe. Uh, to be very honest with you. Um, like Pam, I, I do feel as though this is a significant time and um, with all that's going on, not only in America, but around the world. And I know um, we're going to be discussing that later as we go on, so I won't um, be you know, too long-winded about that. But uh, even though I am uh, basically concentrating on trying to be safe and to keep my health up, uh, I, I am noticing what's going on, <laughs> you know? So um, I'd love to have this conversation with you today to, um, to talk about that. Um, I'm glad to hear that you guys are okay. And the first question that me and Rain had was, what was the difference between your reasoning to you guys' reasoning to being a part of making a difference and being activists to me and, well, Rain and I's reasoning. Why don't you tell us first about your reasoning and then we can see if ours is any different than yours? Because Um, I don't think it is. My reasoning was, well, basically it really started around the Trayvon Martin situation and it was really big to me because I made Facebook to live post about it and to like post my emotions about it and how I feel. And then when I heard the not guilty, it really made me feel like I was helpless at that time because I was young. I think I was like 10 or something. I think, I don't know. I think I was 10, but it really made me feel helpless. But I knew that if I did, I felt like if I used my words and projected how I felt through my words, it would make a difference. And to now I'm in a, technically an adult now so I can really make a difference I feel like I can really make a difference and that's one of my reasonings hopefully I made sense 
Hmm. Well, I would well, say I, Mary. I mean, sorry. Go right ahead. I'm sorry. Go right ahead. I would say my reasoning is for connection. I believe in order to to um to achieve connection with other people, you have to also fight for equality. If that makes any sense. But my main reasoning was for connection and to feel like I was a part of the community, you know? I've always been like someone who's felt extremely disconnected from what's going around and what's happening, even though I know that it affects me. And by actively participating to help change the things that affect me, it helps me feel more connected. Okay, well, you know, my, my uh, reasoning for wanting to make a difference, if I'm really addressing the point that you're making, is that um, for me, it was just a natural. I mean, I, I, I actually grew up in a time when there was true segregation. Uh, you know, the, you know, the differences is we, we didn't have the same school books as the, the kids, the schools were segregated, so we didn't have the same school books that the, the, uh, those, the white kids had at their schools. Um, basically, we went to separate restrooms, we drank from separate water fountains, uh, up until about the time that I left to go to college in 1967. So, um, so it was, it, you know, basically living and not wanting to accept second class status is um, what made me want to make a difference, especially when I was raised in a family where my parents uh, said that I wasn't second class. So don't act like I'm second class, you know, you know what I'm saying? So um, uh, Charleston was a little different from other places that I traveled to during the civil rights movement. Uh, in particular, I went to school in Alabama and um, we, we were segregated here in Charleston, just like they were segregated in Alabama. But the movement uh, was conducted, uh, or, or there were some happenings in the movement that happened down there that we didn't have to confront here in terms of certain kinds of violence and large marches with Dr. King and those coming in, you know, having a, we, we had marches here, but not like Selma or Birmingham, you know, down in Alabama. So. Um, uh, you know, we, it was out of a desire to not want to be a second class citizen that made me want to make a difference. And I guess for me, it was, I don't remember much about the marches here because I think I was um, probably uh, no more than four or five when some of that was going on. I remember a little bit about it because my mom was a LPN when the MUSC um, walkout happened, the MUSC strike. So we lived right next to Morris Brown AME Church where a lot of the um, meetings were held. Uh, but I think my mom kind of protect us from being a part of that. And just as a child, you know, you, you don't focus on that. But I also remember my aunt marching around the city because the, at that time they were marching around, um, on St. Philip Street and, and Cumming Street going around and, and around. And one thing I remember was like my my brother saying that he's not going to get arrested for anybody. And then him and my um, uncle Larry stood out on the, by, on the corner store and they got picked up for being um, out after um, curfew time. So, you know, as I grew older, I learned more about the MUSC strike as well as other things that was happening because um, learning about my history was an important part of who I, who I wanted to be. I wanted to know, you know, where I came from and about um, the 60s and the 70s. So I made um, sure I read about it, but um, it wasn't a part of my experience 
it was just a part of what I um, wanted to know about to kind of figure out who I am and where I wanted to go. So uh, Darren, you mentioned about how uh, your parents raised to, you to not see yourself as like a second citizen. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, am I incorrect? No, yeah, I, I did say that, a second class citizen. So you said that they taught you to not view yourself as a second class citizen. How would you say they supported you in the actions you took toward activism? Well, they didn't really support me uh, in terms of uh, activism, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, and I'll tell you why. I, you know, uh, uh, Pam used the phrase that her mom's kind of sheltered them, you know, uh, when it came to a lot of the trouble that was around and that kind of thing. And um, pretty much it was the same way. I, I didn't take part in a local, I'm talking about here in Charleston. Um, it changed once I went, went to school in Alabama, you know, we, we all go to college and become revolutionaries. Huh? But anyway, uh, while I was here, uh, I wasn't that active, you know, I, uh, I would already gone to college when they had that hospital strike that Pam was referring to. So we had some marches here, there were department stores downtown that were segregated and um, they had lunch counter sit-ins to um, try to integrate those um, places and the stores and they demonstrated in front of the department stores downtown and um, it, unlike other places here in Charleston, you know, once they demonstrated for a, a short period of time, then they went about hiring one or two people from our community, you know, to uh, try to placate people. But um, yeah, in terms of um, me growing up, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I was, you know, like I said, just um, uh, kind of sheltered from that, uh, was, was kind of young myself um, so you know my folks didn't didn't uh, take kindly to me being out there with the marches that were going on here most of those young people were in high school uh, older than, a little older than I was so but um, what I talked about in terms of um, my parents raising me it, it was they, I was raised with a self a sense to be confident in my abilities you know and to work hard to, um, you know, try to do well in school and that kind of thing. And with the understanding that no one was better than me, no matter what their skin color was, whether they were in our community or in the white community, you know, um, there was a certain amount of, of um, uh, discrimination between those in the African American community based on complexion, you know, skin color and that kind of thing. But, um, I was I was raised not to let that bother me to the point where I thought I was inferior to anybody. You know, I was just as smart as anybody, and and I had the same rights as other people in my community. Um, but the folks in my community basically were denied rights in the general community, but within my community, you know, my church, my school, my home. You know, yeah, I was taught that um, I was just like anybody else. Uh, what about you, Pam? Um, like Farron said, one of the things about um, being segregated um, is that that segregation also happens within your community, but as a Black community, you have people who care about you. You see those people. Um, Although I didn't live in a segregated community because the grocery stores, you know, um, like on the corner of Cannon and um, St. Philip was Sigwald's and, um, and the others, he was um, a white man and the, um, the um, corner store was Mr. Canellis. And anytime we got in trouble, you know, he felt free to go up and call our parents and tell tell them what we were doing. And then like <laughs> next door, we lived by um, Miss, uh, I think it was Miss Folks, where she, we always um, went in her um, pecan, in her yard to the pecan tree and 
then there are black people, there are white people, there are Jewish people, and but it was a community and we all, I mean, being as young as I was, we all saw it as a neighborhood where we could go to any house and get food and not the white people house, but they would, you know, when Mr. Sigwell got drunk, he bought the whole block of food, you know, hot dogs and stuff. And so, you know, they saw us as, um, they didn't see, I, you know, I, I don't know what's in their head, but we didn't feel like they were being um, racist against us. We, we saw it as somebody, you know, we could go to and explain our problems. And I remember I went to the um, store for my grandmother one time and I didn't get my change back. And he said, well, when the, when the store closes, um, he'll cash, check the cash register and see if there's any extra money in there. And he gave me the money back, you know? Um, so we were, I mean, I'm sure all around there was segregation going on because I think I remember um, like there in that there was a water fountain in Edwards that had black and white on it. But uh, the, the idea that I um, was conscious every day of the segregation that went on around me is something that I didn't notice. I, you know, I went to Courtney Elementary, but I didn't, I, it was, at the time, I think it was, no, I know it was all black. And most of it was black teachers. I went to Burke High School and it was all black and all black teachers. So in my formative years, I've been in the black community surrounded by the love of that community. Um, a lot of what I felt was kind of being poor <laughs> more than being um, discriminated against because at that time that was before you had um, free lunch. So sometimes you had lunch to carry to school and sometimes you did. And if you ate it for breakfast, you didn't have it for lunch. So you went outside. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know? so it sounds familiar. It's coming up. That's a, that's a very interesting perspective. Um, obviously, I didn't have to deal with like um, segregation growing up, but I did realize when I was a lot younger that I was mostly surrounded by um, white kids. Um, I, got, I was raised up in Mount Pleasant for most of my elementary uh, years. And so it was either me or one other black kid in the classroom, uh, maybe, maybe three at most. Which is, which sounds weird to me now seeing it, but that's how my experience was. So when I um, when I moved to Mitchell for my uh, first year of middle school, sixth grade, it was kind of a bit of a culture shock because I was going from like fully uh, classrooms where I was was sometimes the only black kid to being like in classrooms where I was with a whole bunch of other um, children of my ethnicity. It was, it was really weird, to say the least. Mm -hmm. I would so like, I, like to sorry. point out that we all went to Burke High School and then we're all alumni. It was like pointing that out. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> but I guess um, one of the, I guess, incidents I can talk about that uh, really um, kind of touch on what it's like to be in a community that's in uproar uh, is when I don't know what year it was or, or whatever, but I know I was um, working at um, Fraser Elementary and there was a police shooting um, and they had um, a meeting with the members of the police department um, and they had it at Frazier Elementary and there was Quadro Campbell, Campbell in the community and the community was very upset 
and you, I mean, you, you, you felt it, you, you, you felt it and you, you kind of worry about where you, where you were standing. And I said, I really don't want to stand by any policeman at this point because I don't know what would happen. But you, you, I was just at that time and even afterward, I was just imagining what it would, what it was like being there in the 60s every day uh, going through these um, going through these uh, community meetings having these people being killed having um, and having people stand up for their rights even though they might be killed and 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 that yet that was the closest I came to knowing at least for a little bit what the 60s was like. And, and the feeling of it was scary. But the thing about it was, that's the first time I heard of Ford Campbell. And the fact that he was there and he was the voice of reason and he kind of tell, told the community I know you're angry, but let's listen. And they gave the policeman a chance, the police commissioner a chance to talk. And um, that's when I first knew that he was somebody in the community that um, had the air of the community, although other things happened to kind of change his trajectory of being a leader in Charleston, I was very kind of proud of what he did that day. I would say it's really interesting, um, simply because now we have a lot of programs to try to ease the relationship between like the police force and the communities that they reside in. And I, I say it's interesting because during times like this, are, are they really helping? Are they really connecting the communities that there's like, are these programs really connecting the communities with the police officers um, that reside in them? I mean, I don't have any numbers or statistics to say, oh, it's helped improve um, the, the it, it has or hasn't helped improve this amount of relationships. But as I see it, it really hasn't, you know? Right. And, and I guess I'm, right now I'm disconnected from some of the communities you're talking about because um, I don't live um, downtown or, or in, um, in, a, in a place where um, there's a lot of tension, like probably North Charleston and, and on certain streets. And a lot of my attention has been with um, the Connected Two project, where um, we um, we touch on it, but we don't live it. You know, um, I I saw the other day where um, North Charleston had done a study about the um, the police brutality that's going on, but they won't release the report. So um, the fact that you collect information but afraid to give it to the public is not a um, situation where people will feel that they can trust you. And um, trust is kind of an important thing to offer the community you're policing. Well, personally, um, as far as uh, my my history, you know, with um, police and the society that we live in is I've, um, I've never really seen them as being just uh, um, in terms of the, let's just say, overall department. And the reason why I put it in that context is because when I was a child growing up, the black officers patrolled the black neighborhoods and the white cops patrolled the white neighborhoods. And it, it, it probably started to change, um, like I said, in the late 60s when I was about ready to leave Charleston. But when I was a child growing up, um, it was difficult 
for uh, African American policemen to arrest a white man, <laughs> you know, not only in Charleston but anywhere in the South, just about right down, and maybe some places in the North too. But the I've never, I didn't know the police to make a serious effort at um, engaging the community as a policy of the department. Um, let's just say there were certain cops, uh, uh, Mr. Walter Burke, one of the first African-American policemen in Charleston. And um, as a matter of fact, he went to my church, Mr. Burke, but he was the closest thing to a community police because he lived, he lived, he was the one that lived in the area of Charleston where I lived along with a couple of other officers, uh, Officer Ward and those, and they were known to us because they lived in that community. But I've never known the police department in Charleston to have some policy created or to work under a policy where we're going to try to be right by the community and we're going to try to be fair. And, you know, my, my uh, most negative experience I've had with the policeman occurred, um, I think it was about 1982. Yeah, because that's, um, that's the year that I moved to Columbia. But uh, I moved to Columbia and um, to work and my family didn't move until a couple of weeks, a couple of months after I started working in Columbia. And I was home one weekend and one Sunday evening before I left to go back to um, Columbia to start work on Monday, my wife asked me to go to the grocery store and get some stuff for the kids school lunch the next day and that kind of thing. And my son, Karan, who is now 43 years old, but at the time he was five years old. And he and I, I walked into the Piggly Wiggly in Northbridge uh, back then. And all of a sudden I found myself being slammed against a counter or a shelf in the Piggly Wiggly. I mean, vegetables and cans of corn and green beans flying everywhere, you know, because the cop had slammed me up against the uh, counter. And the folks who work in the store were standing at the end of the aisle and, and they were trying to tell him, not him, not him, not him. Well, what happened was somebody in the Piggly Wiggly called the police and said there was somebody shoplifting in the meat section. And the person that was doing the shoplifting had a brown jacket on. I had a brown corduroy jacket on. So without asking me a question, without you know trying to find out what's going on, this officer came and slammed me up against the shelf. And like I said, I'm not exaggerating. You should see the cans of vegetables flying everywhere. And um, and when they came up and said, not him, not him, and he said, oh, and he kind of like pushed me to balance himself so he could run down the aisle after somebody else. And, um, and I said, man, you're not even going to apologize? And he turned around and he said, sue me. Hmm. <laughs> and I called the um, police department the next day and um, I was assigned to talk to a lieutenant. I'll leave names out. But I, I was told to talk to this particular lieutenant who was African American. And he said, well, he'll take my report, you know, so forth and so on. And they would get back to me. And a month went by and I never heard anything. And when I did call back to the police department, I, um, I, they, I was told that the chief had the report. And when the chief got on the telephone, he acted like I was the criminal, like I did something wrong. You know, I shouldn't even have. So that's my experience with the police in Charleston. And for a long time, I had a lot of animosity toward the police in Charleston, and in particular, the police chief, even though he was African-American, because of the response I got when I tried to report the abuse that I had received from one of his, one of his officers, you know? But the, the main point is that without questioning, without saying anything, he just took for granted that I was a black guy with a brown jacket on, so I must have been the thief. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And with no conversation whatsoever. So, um, I don't, um, I don't, I don't remember or recognize Charleston's police department as trying to do anything or having any kind of policy to improve their image in my community. Now they did some things after the Emanuel massacre, where um, uh, the chief at the time started to have the um, uh, the meetings with the churches and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, it, pardon me but I'm getting older and it escaped me the name of the um, initiative that they have going on. And it's still, from my understanding, still be going on. But that was what, 2016 when that started? Yeah, 2016. <laughs> yeah, 2016. I'm 66 years old back then. So, <laughs> so, so for the first 66 years of my life, I can't identify any kind of specific effort by the local police in the Charleston region 
to try to establish some kind of good rapport with the community. I'm just, uh, I'm just um, shocked. You never got an apology for what, what could have been considered assault. That's assault. Yeah, and, and, and just think, that's tame compared to what's happening today. <laughs> you know, Philando Castile, don't, don't let me start naming the names, you know, but all of these brothers were killed by the cops, you know, unarmed, you know, Walter Scott not doing anything. So what happened to me is minor what happened to, as compared to what happened to them even 50 years later after my incident, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, or 40 years after my incident. And um, that same kind of thing was still going on. So it... Um, it um, it just bothered me over the years, so I'm so happy to see that now, uh, now we we are speaking up. Um, not just black people, but take a look at the diversity, you know, of the marchers and the protesters out there now, and folks are speaking up to say, well, wait a minute, you know, I've been living in my bubble, and my life has improved, and my life has been all right, but look at what's happening to my fellow countrymen, you know, no matter what color they are, but it just so happens that the police abuse toward black males or African American males is more extreme than it is against any other group of people. So um yeah, I'm just um I'm pleased that um that we're out there now and I see that um we don't have a whole lot of time left. So I, I I'm gonna let you get back to your questions. I'm sorry. Oh well the questions weren't um they, they, we don't have to get to all of them. They were just prompts for if the conversation like lost its flow or uh, something like that. Oh, well, well, let me um, make a point because um, one of the things that you said was what would be advice to younger generations. And I, I just think it's important to educate yourself, learn the history of your people, your family, your country, you know, and the more educated you are, the less you'll be misled or allowed to be misled. And um, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that um, the voices that I hear on the news networks and the regular network newscasts, the voices that I hear of the protesters in the street, the, the young African-Americans, and they, they express themselves so well. And, and a lot of them are aware of the history of their people, you know, to, um, to say, well, I'm not going to accept the fact that things are so much better for me than they were for my parents because they're not really that good for me <laughs> when it's all said and done. So uh, I always had that um, concern that um, my children in particular, you know, was not raised in the same kind of society that I was raised in. So I had concerns that they would think that all is well, you know, all is hunky dory. And even though they hadn't been picked on by the police or, or, or experienced, you know, a, a level of poverty. And I'm saying it like that because under no way, form, or fashion was I wealthy or <laughs> had any kind of wealth like that, but I tried my best to provide for my family. So my kids basically weren't exposed to the segregation, the discrimination, and a lot of what was going on. And, and the tendency is to think that, oh yeah, well, things are great. No, things are not great. Look around you, look and see what's happening. You know, Philando Castillo told the officer, I've, I've legally, I'm legally in possession of a weapon, let me show you my paperwork. And he gets shot trying to show the policeman his paperwork. And did you hear anything from the National Rifle Association about that? You know, they go around saying that everybody ought to be able to have guns and everybody ought to be able to carry guns, with no permits or nothing. You know, it's, um, you know, hey, listen, uh, remember when they, a couple of weeks ago, when the guys took over the Capitol building in Michigan to say they wanted the economy to be opened back up? And these right. guys are standing up on the national news with weapons of war. They've got on combat gear and they've got guns that belong only on the battlefield. You know, they don't belong on the streets and they're holding these guns. And I said to myself, when I saw that, as I was watching the news, I said, you know what? Only white men in America can do that. Can you imagine a man of color going to the Capitol building in any state with weapons of war on their shoulder, yelling at the politicians, and to think that the cops are just going to stand by and say, well, they've got Second Amendment rights. They've got First Amendment rights. No, only white men can do that in America. <laughs> you know? We would get shot. If, if right. we pulled that stunt, we would get shot. Exactly. Because we, so, it would be seen as an act of terrorism. Right. So young people have to educate themselves so they can be aware of what's going on around them. 
and so that they can intelligently address them, intelligently come up with policies and proposals to change ways for the better, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's my answer to uh, my advice to younger generations today. It's sound advice, very solid, very solid advice. But it just, all just, just makes me wonder, like, are policemen inherently, you know, pre-justice, pre-judice, I can never say it correctly, but are they inherently, like, profiling us, or is, are, are, is their training just not up to standards, up to adequacy, to the point where they are able to be calm, collected, and in these situations? I feel like um, everyone has a prejudice and it's just the way that really how you're taught. Because when you look at the history books, they don't tell you, well, in the history books, it sugarcoats the slavery and telling you it's a necessary evil and that these people who praise God and do godly things and feel like um, they have to fight for justice they see someone else who bleeds the same blood they bleed, but are different color, they see them as slaves. And like, I feel like this is a prejudice that's always been taught. And hopefully black teachers and, teachers and students, well, everybody teaches themselves the real truth, real, the reality of what happened. Do you think, do you think there should be like, training sessions and classes that actively teach policemen anti like anti pre judice and anti racism i i honestly i want to say no because why do we have to teach you how to be human that's my first thought but because people are who they are yes it needs to be done because when they do something like if they kill well, if they murder another African-American male, it could be used that they understood, well, they had the classes and knowledge of like empathy and empathy towards another race or something like the classes that, been, that you're proposing now, you know? Um, I don't really think it makes a difference because if you listen to the news, they, they have been conversation just about on all the channel about how much training policemen do get. And I, and I, you know, they're talking about giving them more training, but like your first thought was, nobody need to teach you to be human. That um, Richard, um, I forgot his last name, that Oops. got killed. Rashad Brooks that got killed the other day. He was drunk in a car. Um, he wasn't driving drunk. He was sleeping drunk. They said they had a conversation for about 40 minutes mm -hmm. back and forth um, about both of, and both of them were calm and they and they were talking and getting to know one another in terms of having wanting to go to his um, daughter's um, birthday party the next day so that meant he didn't really want to go to jail and um, and he even said that his sister lived right around the corner um, can he walk to his um, sister's house and leave his car where it was I I, I don't know, I can't say for sure, but if a white person had asked for that same um, favor, to just, I know I'm drunk, um, just let me, just give me this, um, this, just be this human, to just let me walk away around the corner. You know, you got my license, you got my car, I don't have a gun on me. Can you let me go um, this time? And, and in, a, in a minute, it changes because you lock him up and then you go from being human to being inhuman by shooting him in the back like they did Walter Scott. You know, 
no amount of training going to tell you that you shouldn't shoot, shoot somebody in the back. That should be, you know, in your heart. Yeah, you know, yeah. you can catch them another day. And, and Rain, when you talk about community policing and, you know, policies where the police has, have improved relationships with the community, you know, if the cops really wanted to be a part of that community, they could have given him a ride down the street and, you know, taken him to his sister's house. Well, you're drunk. So instead of taking you to jail where I've got to do all that paperwork, I'll give you a ride two blocks down the street just to make sure that you're not driving drunk on my streets, you know, with, with the police. Or why, why, why couldn't they say, okay, well, uh, what's, your, what's your sister's telephone number? We'll call and tell one of them to come pick up the car and to get you. We just don't want you driving in the street. You know, so to Pam's point, you know, he'd already said that he wanted to attend his daughter's birthday party. You know, it's the weekend, so he'd go to jail. He'd probably be in jail the entire weekend, you know, and that kind of thing. So, you know, if you're really interested in your community, and the other thing about training, I heard just this morning on one of the news programs that the officer that shot uh, Brother Brooks had eight and a half hours of de-escalation training. <laughs> so where was his training when he could have de-escalated that situation and and Brooks would still be alive today, you know? So it's it's um it's 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 really it's it's really hard to it's really hard to um <sighs> You know, we, we, like I said, things, things have got to change. And I'm, I'm just glad that in society, we're realizing that. And that's, it's um, people are in the streets all over the world, you know, uh, talking about the same thing. And that's injustice. And even though in other countries, they're still, they're, they've got signs with um, uh, George Floyd's name on those signs, but they're dealing with the discriminations in their own countries, you know, with the, with the people of color from mm -hmm. other countries and those right. people, and they're going through the same kind of discrimination, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough out there, but it's, it's got to change, you know? There's no reason in the world that, um, you know, um, 70 years after the <laughs> Civil Rights Bill was signed or whatever, 60 years after the Civil Rights Bill was signed and cops are still killing black men at the rate in which we're being shot, you know? Listen, I had two sons and I had to have that conversation with my sons and both of them had to learn the hard way. I, I would tell them, don't, don't drive your car around with more than one person in the car because anytime they see more than two black young men in a car, you're going to get stopped. And both of my sons learned that, well, daddy, you were right. They, I mean, they get stopped for all kinds. Oh, you floated through a stop sign. Oh, the, the light isn't on over your license plate. No, but you know, you sit around riding with three or four young African Americans in the car, the police will stop you, you know? And, uh, and if you don't act right, you're going to get shot. So yeah, I had to have that conversation with my sons, you know, and, and they had to learn the hard way, <laughs> you know, that time. Okay, well, this time dad knew what he was talking about. That's it's kind big. of scary that you have to, that you had to have that conversation, like uh, uh, somebody of, you know, somebody who's white wouldn't have to have that conversation with their kids. But the fact that you had to say, oh, you can't be in a car with your friends, um, something that's normal should be considered everyday normal is, is just, it's scary. It's concerning. Can I also um, address something else that, that you brought up um, in the uh, questions that you uh, sent that uh, may be a part of our discussion? Um, <clears throat> You, you, you asked about the um, connection between the Black Lives Matter and, um, and the churches, I think it was. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the way, I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, what are ways that uh, Black, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter is connected to the African-American church and how do they influence each other in, in my eyes or in our eyes? And... Um, I don't know if there's a connection between the church and the Black Lives Matter movement, but the church was integral in the overall movement to try to end segregation and to try to find justice or to end injustices toward our people. And the church played a major role in that, but I don't know of any churches that were involved with the organization itself, Black Lives Matter. Um, but it's undeniable that the church played a major role, uh, but in a different kind of way, you know. So whereas the, 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 
the marches in the old days started at the church. The people had the meetings in the church. Then they left the church to protest and march on the street. And that's, that's not occurring now. But churches now, African-American churches now, are creating foundations that they use to educate, to help with voter registration and that kind of thing. Um, the foundations and doing community outreach, you know, to try to aid folks that are in distress in communities and that kind of thing. So that's the role that I see churches playing now in this particular movement versus affiliating themselves with an organization like Black Lives Matter. The concept of Black Lives Mattering, yeah, is still part of the church thing, but in terms of the organizational effort of that, I don't see a connection. So, um, Rain had to leave for her meeting, and she said she said to um, miss the rest of this great, this really good conversation. And I think when we were making the question for the connection with churches and Black Lives Matter, I think it was, it was, it's, it was inspired by a conversation of us saying like how religion connects I think it was in terms of black people mm -hmm. and like I was saying like if I started look every voice and sing I know that another black person that I never met before might sing um till orphan heaven rings so it's really seeing how church is a connector and trying to relate that to how black lives matter is a connector between two black people who might never have known each other ever. Mm -hmm. I hope that's making sense. No, no, I think I think you're reinforcing the point that I was making in that the concept of Black Lives Mattering has always been a part of the black church, the African American church. You know, a lot of the protests and the marches and everything came out of the churches, that's what I'm saying. But now you have like a hashtag organization, of, you know, and I'm not technical, I'm not the most technical person in the world, so forgive me if I'm not describing it correctly, but I see on TV that they're interviewing people who were the founders of Black Lives Matter. So if you got a founder, that means you got an organization. And I'm just saying that the concept of Black Lives Mattering has always been important to the African-American church, but I don't see a connection between any of the black churches, at least in my experience, with the organization of Black Lives Matter. So I think you were saying the same thing, uh, Aisha, that I was, you know, the point I was trying to make. I think we're on the same page there. And I think that's mostly a generational thing because yes. like you said, Aaron, I cannot, I do not use a computer well. Um, but I mean, when um, Trayvon Martin um, was killed, you know, um, young people at that time, the people who, um, formed um, Black Lives Matter went straight to their um, um, iPads and iPhone and they, they just talked to each other through, the, um, through email and say, um, we have to do something about this. Let's meet here or let's meet there. And, you know, like even for me today where I'm pretty good with Facebook just um, going on, you, you, you get on a... Um, thread and you just um, talk and you have people come and, um, um, you know, like what you say it and uh, write a comment and you start back and forth. Because that's how, um, you know, well, Victoria and I, you know, um, talked about having the book club because I think, you know, through my um, feelings of outrage and hurt, um, you know, I found um, some uh, uh, an email that talk about um, anti-racist book, and I sent it out to you know some of the teachers um, at the school, and then just just talking back and forth on Facebook, we you know said um, you you know we are you know, I think one of the teachers said we ought to start a book club, you know, and and everybody said yeah. You know, I would join that book club, but I was saying that, you know, that we need to not talk about it, but actually do it. We yeah, are not racist, but it's, it's more than being just not racist. You have to be against racism. And we're going to start that on the 30th of this month and see, for me, is 
um, I'm more of my lane is working with kids in schools and just to get teachers looking at how they work with black and brown kids and making sure that they look at their biases. Because like um, you said earlier, we all have biases and we have to look at it and we have to see how we are affecting kids, you know, in our classroom, because I don't know if y'all saw over the last couple of weeks where teachers in school are writing on emails about how black people should go back to Africa. And if we don't like this country, we, you know, we could leave it. Um, and they are teaching black and brown kids. And I mean, the school system and firing them left and right, but the fact that they feel free enough to put that out there is mind boggling. And Pam, you know what's so insulting about the whole thing? The ones who think that are, 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 are expressing that uh, about go back where, we probably have more right to be here than they are, than they do. Our, mm -hmm. our people probably go back hundreds of years being here before they came. Came, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the person that makes that kind of statement, you know, yeah, go back yeah. to where you're from, you know. I got more right to be here than you. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. And to think that nobody's gonna say anything, to think that you could say that, to think, you know, is you you feeling free. I guess, you know, you feel free to be racist. Mm -hmm. And you don't think there's any consequence to it because what they're saying is they have a right to um, speak their mind. Yeah, but you, you have a right to say anything you want to say, but there's people have a right to um, put consequences on what you say as well because right. your freedom ends where mine begins. And you know what that leads me to um, uh, the conversation about privilege you know, we hadn't talked about today, but you know, that it's, it's really refreshing every time I hear um, a, a white citizen, you know, uh, whether or not they're an acquaintance of mine, a friend of mine, or just somebody I'm watching on TV. But when I hear each one say that, okay, I now understand what they mean when they say that, uh, I, that I've, I'm, I've got privilege or I view privilege to my advantage. You know, and it's because it's so easy, like you said a minute ago, it's so easy to say that I'm not racist. No, I'm not racist. But guess what? You do feel like you're privileged, so you feel like you got an advantage, you know, over me, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And and it goes way back, it goes way back to like reconstruction after the Civil War. Like I heard Martin Luther King say, you know, that when when the plantation owners were told by the government that they can go back down south and reclaim their plantations because they thought they had lost their plantations because they were they lost the war. So they figured that they weren't going to have those plantations and all of a sudden Andrew Jackson, who was a racist that succeeded Lincoln, told all the rich planters, go back down south and get your property back. You know, you, you can get your plantations back. And when they got down there, they found out that the whites in the south were doing just as bad as the former slaves because mm -hmm. that's how hard life was in the South after after slavery and they couldn't, you know, cotton and all that kind of stuff that they were poor, whites who were just as poor as the former slaves. And the plantation owners came back and told them, says, listen, no matter how poor you are and how bad you're doing, you're still better than them, pointing to us, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. people of color. So that's what they told them. So, so like Martin Luther King said, the rich planters came back down South and gave Jim Crow to the poor whites and gave us the Bible and told us, you know, keep praying, you know, things gonna get better one day. But he told the poor white says, no matter how bad you're doing, you're still better than those black people. And that's where privilege, you know, they, they've always, they carried that privilege for another 150 years, even to today. Mm -hmm. you, man. you know what, no matter how bad I'm doing and no matter how well somebody else is doing, I'm still better than them because my skin color is different. And that's, that's privilege. So when I hear, Whites recognize today that privilege has been something that they've used to get on top and to stay on top, and that's not fair. Then I said, well, maybe we got a chance of things getting better, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but and and the second part of that, uh, the, 
the other side of that coin is the fact that those same white owners use um, poor white people as a wedge between um, them and um, black people. That's right. Because, you know, you look at um, you look at um, Black Wall Street and other Black Wall Streets across the country. You know, you talk about Tulsa, but you 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 look at other areas where even though you want to separate from black people when they have a thriving community you find any reason to take away what they have mm -hmm. and you keep it you know you destroy the whole city because you didn't like the fact that they were thriving you didn't like the fact that you were poor so you find a reason you call it something a, a man rape a white woman and you you destroy that community and you ran them off and you took their property. So all of that just show you, because right now Trump is using the fact that these poor white people um, against black people, because he knows and they know then he doesn't really care about them, but they have another person they get blame, mm -hmm. you know. The, the fact that they, these, you know, I saw one man on, on a Facebook uh, page where he was asking Barack Obama to show his um, Harvard degree. <laughs> this man had no teeth, <laughs> looked like he had no job, but he felt he had the right to ask the president of the United States Privilege. His <laughs> for, um, his birth certificate and his degree because his skin was white. <laughs> that's gall, you know. I'm telling that's, you, <laughs> that's 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 really. Tough. I just looked at his no teeth self and said, "Who the hell are you?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you. So you know, maybe there were changes gonna come. You know, listen to Sam Cook. Just a little yeah. while ago, it was on the radio, and change is going to come. And I just sat in my car, and I parked it and listened, you know, and, and just reflected on what's going mm -hmm. on now, you know? So, hopefully. Hey, uh, before we uh, before we end, um, I, I happened to pick up the um, city paper last week, and I saw the graduating class of Burke High School, and as a proud alumni of Burke High School, you should have seen the grin on my face when I saw the picture of the valedictorian for this year's graduating class at Burke School. Congratulations, Asia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that. Oh, that was so wonderful when I saw that. I said, like, oh, you mean I've been working with the valedictorian? <laughs> and uh, like I said, I'm a proud Burke alumni, alumnus myself, so congratulations, Asia. So I'm uh, really, really proud of you. So how Thank do you, you feel, Asia? Um, about uh, right now. Do, yeah, how do you feel about being a youth leader? How do you how do you feel about what's going on now? Where do you think this is going? And what would you see as your um, part in advancing? You know, the um, the concept of um, our, our, um, Black Lives Matter, Black Children Matter, our futures matter? Uh, I can answer. Well, at first I was very angry, sad, and I realized I was an empath or an empathetic person because off of social media, I was reading like the deaths of so many people um, by police and actually see it, watching the videos really hurt me and I cried through it all. And like every single one, I just kept crying on it. And then I had to stop. I took a break from social media and then I, um, I just thought about why I had to fight more and why it, well not like why I, decided to go to a black school, go to the HBCU, and it's really because when you sit and listening to the conversation the ideas that your classmates who are black as well, and you listen to them understand like it's not right, and to see them, well, hear them voice their opinions on what they would do, and to actually see them do it, because some of them went on the protest downtown, 
on Facebook Live. I was scared for them, but they did it and they survived, and I'm happy about that. And how do I? What's my impact on what? How I feel my impact on Black Lives Matter movement? Um, being a black, so hopefully I'll be the black educator that is transparent about everything. And I really want to be an example to all of my students, no matter the color, that you will face so many defeats, but you must not be defeated, like Maya Angelou said. And it's really crazy to see so many people of the same color be killed. And it's like, we're not talking about it. Why are we not talking about it? As a teacher, I want to expose my students to that. And I want to really understand that English and language and it's an art and they can use their art to be against racism, prejudice, stereotypes, everything. So I hope I'm making sense with this, but you know. I heard you say you're going to HBCU. Where are you going to school? North Carolina a &T. Oh, Aggie, huh? Okay. All righty. <laughs> Well, good luck. Congratulations again. Thank you. Yeah, and I think at some point, because I mean, we touched on a couple of points, but I think um, we might need to revisit this conversation in a couple of weeks. I mean, just to see what Congress is going to do and what states are going to do, because I, I think this is a turning point. I think the time is now for all of us to see what actions we as individuals could do to change things, but also be a part of that um, larger community. Because if we don't continue to support, you know, the people who are out on the street, but um, take it to a level where you're talking about changing um, policies and practices in, in not only the police department, but the schools. And, you know, even we talk about economic um, parity or um, equity. Those are things that I believe um, um, Tiny is Powerful was you know, um, um, form to do, you know, and I think um, all of us can um, make a choice to do a little bit more to make sure we don't go backwards in terms of accepting just the minimum, because like um, the Republicans and, and you know, Senator Scott saying that there, you know, with uh, there are certain things the Republicans just won't accept, you know, and we're saying that this isn't about you and what you will accept. It's about us and what we will accept, you know. You know, you might be the spokesperson for the Republican Party, but you're not the only um, party out here, you know. We can't let, because all of them are doing this uh, um, President Trump thing that you're going to bully your way through this. But I think a lot of people are, you know, that are marching and especially I'm part of the young people are saying that we're not listening to you if you're not listening to us. We don't hear you if you don't hear us. And we're going to stay in the street and we're going we're gonna to stand here and we're going to we're going to fight for what we believe is right because you're trying to move us backwards and we want to move forward. Definitely. I'm really prepared for conversation. Well, the next conversation. What did you say? I said, um, definitely. I'm really prepared and excited for the next conversation because this one is really great. Yeah, me too. Okay, I enjoy participating. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. All righty, bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Thanks, guys. Aisha, do you have a minute? I do. Okay. Th Theron and Pam, I didn't get to hear the whole conversation, but I, I, what I did hear um, was was nourishing and it was good. And I actually, you know, you guys both separately touched on things that had been on my mind. Um, Pam, specifically, when you talked about um how some of these people you were you referenced the educator who so on a public forum had no problem with making comments about black people needing to go back to africa i was just talking about how you know i've always been aware of of racism and hate and discrimination like you know i've always been aware but it seems like right now you know there are people coming out like with no shame they're you know no shame, no compassion, no, you know, no, no, not even enough to care about your job. I mean, even there are, there's an, a lawyer, an attorney who was making these same like outlandish, blatantly, overtly racist comments, multiple, you know, and as if people weren't going to take a screenshot and call him out as if he had nothing to worry about. You know, I did see a recent update that the South Carolina bar banned his practice um but that that was that's yeah. why and, and that's why i say it's uh, a lot of people talk about facebook but it's a an important tool because you can't you know you can take that screenshot and you could demand that these people who are in public position um, who have um, access to um, black and brown kids who could decide whether or not you keep your job or not, lose theirs mm -hmm. when they cross the line. Mm -hmm. Bet on your tiny, tiny castle. Bet on your tiny, tiny dream. Bet on your tiny, tiny businesses. Bet on, bet on, bet on, bet on you. Bet on, bet on, bet on, bet on you. Why you bet on strangers? Strangers pass on through. You should bet on neighbors, cause neighbors bet on you. Your tiny, tiny barber shop. Bet on you. Oh, your tiny, tiny beauty shop. Bet on you. Oh, your tiny, tiny auto shop. Bet on you.